Morning, everybody. Crappy Mondays, especially so if you're back to work and the children are still off school. And welcome to the news agenda of me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by The Mirror's assistant editor, Jason Beatty, who is so committed to the show he is here on his day off. Good morning, Jason. Hello, Susie. <laughs> Hello, all three people that might be watching. Now, this is the People's Paper Review. Uh, so get into the comments, ask us your questions. Uh, those of you listening later on podcast, we'll just have to wait and see if there's a June election that might bring an end to all our misery. Um, so what have we got for you today? Well, the mirror has splashed on, now get this, all right, Turkey plastic surgery clinics offering cut price nose jobs plus veterinary care for the patient's pets. And more on that in a bit. First, I want to go inside the paper where unions are demanding Keir Starmer pardon striking miners when he's in power. Now, Jason, take, me, take us through this a little bit. Aren't they assuming rather a lot? And what do strikers need to be pardoned for exactly? So, interestingly, Susie, the Scottish government has already brought in an act to pardon miners from the strike 40 years ago now i suddenly feel really old gosh um I'm you know, saying, I'm like, not for people of my generation season yeah. this, like, this was a defining moment it it, just, it it decided you know which side of the, the debate you were on in much the same way that the iraq war was for the, the next generation and 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 gaza is for this it was you know this was what made you your politics were and you know, it was I, I, for people who can't remember it. It's, you know, it was a kind of incredibly bitter, horrible dispute, which did split the nation. Yeah. Um, now, so the Scottish government a couple of years ago brought in a, a, a pardon, and and it's based on the fact that a lot of miners were deliberately targeted by the police at the instructions of the Margaret Thatcher government. And uh, they particularly went after um, union officials. Um, and because they got criminal records, they were not entitled to any form of uh, compensation or redundancy. And they had a, 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 a stain against their name. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, interestingly, the Scottish Act, I'm not sure, uh, went so far as to, as to say that if during the strike you resorted to theft in order to feed your family and to make ends meet, that was also pardoned. Uh, so it's quite sweeping. Um, now, um, you can see understandably why that the, the, they would like the, you know, the union leaders and the victims of a strike uh, would like this to be a, a, a UK wide policy, not just for Scotland. So uh, putting pressure on Keir Starmer to do that. Um, I, I mean, separately to this, there's also, you know, a long standing campaign for a proper public inquiry into what happened to Augie. That was the most violent of the clashes uh, when it, the, the, the police, um, according to which version event you want, but, the, you know, the, the police used extraordinary violence um, against um, the miners. Yeah, it was basically a cavalry charge, wasn't there, across a. Yeah. Across the field, basically, batons all over the place. Now, um, what do you think, everybody? Do you think this is something that um, a future Labour government really needs to get on board with? There are an awful lot of historic injustices piling up. We've got the nuclear veterans that we talk about a lot on this show. There's the infected blood scandal. There's Hillsborough. There's Grenfell. There's Orgreave. There's uh, quite a few others as well. Wasp goodness, Waspy Women is the least of it. Um and, you know, Labour is going to be asked, really, to, to make everything right for a lot of people. And, of course, because of the passage of time, there's some things that just can never be made right. Is this one that you think Labour should just be getting on board with and say, yeah, let's just tick that box and say we did it? Um, this you, is, you would think, Jason, sort of fairly firm Labour ground. These are, you know, red wall issues, aren't they? You know, after all. But new Labour under Tony Blair he conspicuously failed to do some of this stuff. Morning, Sharon. Thanks for watching. Nice to know there's someone there. Um, Blair didn't do this because, you know, he didn't really want to hark back to the, and Morning, Chris Bell, didn't want to hark back to the industrial battles of the past and, and what Labour used to be. He wanted to focus on 
what new labor was going to be um is there any indication that Keir isn't going to feel exactly the same about this well now this is quite an interesting one the, the, one of the few policies which has kind of survived the kind of the, the starmer purge of trying to scrape any kind of kind of awkward barnacle off the bottom of a labor boat as it's kind of glides serenely towards victory in the general election is actually be angela rayner's um new deal for workers um which is um you know a very fairly decent package of of, of, of employment laws for including things from you know kind of um banning um uh, zero hours contracts um to improving the repealing most of the, the, the recent conservative anti-trade union laws so um um the, that is actually one of the things starmer has repeatedly been asked about this you know will you know is it are you absolutely set behind this and he has repeatedly said yes so in some respects starmer to be fair to him, because I mean, like you know, there's a lot of criticism, but he is he he's kind of kind of watered down Labour's policies. This is the one one he's stuck by. Now he may argue getting that legislation through takes priority over, let's say, whether there should be a a, a, a pardon for, for for the victims of the 84, 85 strike. Mm. Um, the other problem Labour's got, which you, you 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 touched upon right at the top of that your question, is the Tories are bequeathing them this incredibly expensive legacy of compensation packages so they've been dragging their heels on compensation for the post office victims of the horizon scandal they are still haven't paid the victims of the compens of the, the, the infected blood scandal mm. there's the um lgbt uh former servicemen and women who are also being promised compensation for the discrimination they faced. These bills are mounting up and they're expensive. Um, and you, you can see what the Tories are doing here. They're going, well, we don't want to spend the money now because we'd rather use that money for bribes, tax cuts, giveaways, whatever, ahead of the election. You know, desperate attempt to try and save their skin. Um, you know, Labour gets into power and, and Rachel Reeves, if she becomes Chancellor, that's a lot of money she's got to suddenly find. Mm. When we out wow, because the Tories are basically, you know, bankrupt of a nation. <laughs> yeah, an, an apology is pretty cheap, perhaps, unless it comes attached to something else that you have to start. You know, once you apologise, you start accepting liability, and then then the next step is a payout yeah. of some sort. Of that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I can. I can see the, how Starwood could play this politically by saying, "Look, our focus is on the now. We've got to address the, uh, you know, the injustice facing workers at the moment. That that's our priority." Um, will it make it go away? I doubt it. Is there still a case for a proper investigation, inquiry, whatever you wish to call it, into into Augury? Definitely. Um, but you know, the records have been held until you know 2066, by which time I'll be a hundred. Um, <laughs> but that's a long time. Maybe you should get on the case, Susie. You're quite good at getting records released by noticed. Well, yeah, I've done some recently, but you know, I found some nuclear veterans records this week that are locked until 2092, by which point I would be 115. Right? Never mind how old I'm I'd still be down in the archives in my wheelchair. Come on, let me have it, lads. Uh, Mike says Tories have spent Earth months now sorting the Earth for the next administration, knowing it won't be them. It does seem a bit of a deliberate ploy. But then again, you've got these organisations like the unions here who are going, hang on, we can see Labour coming in. Let's exploit this to do something that we've always wanted to do. And do, do they? Is it necessary? Does it have to happen? So many of the people that are affected will have passed away. Um, and yes, you can sort of say, well, that was bad. It shouldn't have happened. But it can't really ever be fixed. So perhaps it's something that some of our viewers, you might think, um, you know, it sh Labour shouldn't waste its time worrying about, in quote marks. Um, uh, but, 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 so let us know what you think about 
whether or not Labour should do anything on this, but Reform UK is holding a press conference today. And while, you know, they, they usually spend an awful lot of time attacking the Tory government for God knows everything, today they're going to be having a go at Labour for abandoning the working class. They're going to attack the party's record on the NHS and the mine workers' pension scheme, apparently, we're told. That's if uh, the whole, you know, the backdrop doesn't fall down and the Anderson doesn't go off on one. Now, on the one hand, Jason, you know, we've got miners and the insurgent reform UK, both treating Labour as the party of government, which must surely be good news if you vote Labour. But on the other hand, there is plenty of red meat here, isn't there, for both of them to chew on. Keir's going to have other things on his plate when and if he takes over at number 10. Is there is there a way perhaps, you know, that reform could perhaps take away some of those, you know, in those Brexit voting red wall seats, reform might make some headway and cause Keir some real headaches? Um, this is kind of, you know, you know, could blatant opportunism by by reform you know i mean but if they were serious about actually kind of workers rights but 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 have a package of measures you know they'd have some policies uh, which, which <laughs> did that. In, instead actually uh, but most of the time they talk about how big the state's got and how they want to roll it back and how they should you know um so there's a kind of you know I, I mean, I'm, I don't think they deserve to be taken too seriously. In answer to your question, are they affected Labour? All the polls show so far that the majority of votes they're taking are from the Conservatives, not from Labour. Mm. Um, yeah, there are, there are a few, but it, they're not on a significant level. Um, remember, reform's not standing in every seat. They haven't got the MPs. And it, it, it does appear, looking at the last week, every time they seem to pick an MP, they have to stand down again for or a candidate. They have to stand down again for saying something kind of racist or horrific mm. um, or unpleasant. Um, I think they've lost three candidates in the last week. I think one, one of the candidates they lost at the weekend was someone who was photographed wearing a Union Jack suit and Union Jack sunglasses. Why he wasn't dropped before they even selected him. Well, it was just obvious that guy's going to... seem to have a colander on his head as well, which is even weirder. Um, yeah. <laughs> if there was only some clue that his white person might not be quite suitable. Um, but coming... Yeah, so, so I mean, but, but they are... You know, but the, the, where the real threat they pose is to the Tories, that they, they, they are mopping up quite a substantial number of disaffected Tory voters mm. rather than, than disaffected Labour voters at the moment. Yeah, well, we'll have to see how it goes, won't we, I suppose. Um, there's going to be a lot more, I would have thought, of people starting to treat Labour like the potential party of government, more scrutiny than we've seen over the weekend, like an Angela Rayner's uh, housing arrangements and so on. And there's going to be more of this. But you had this. In 2010, I think as well, before uh, Cameron came to power in the coalition. So there was an awful lot when he was in opposition, a lot of popularity, a lot of green issues, lots of hugging huskies and stuff like this and wind turbines and whatnot. And I can remember at the Sunday Mirror doing loads of stories about, you know, his wind turbine and his nappy recycling and goodness knows what else. Mm -hmm. And um, he had lots of wobbles where he had to change his policies over and over again. He was always taking private jets to places on that campaign trail, I remember, and getting criticised for it. And then, um, you know, he came to power anyway. So having a bit of an unpopular wobble shortly before an of election doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get in. We'll see, won't we? Um, so now on to the main story of the day. And this isn't one that lots of other people are concentrating on, but I think this is quite a big thing, especially for our viewers. Uh, the mirror has splashed on turkey plastic surgery clinics, which we already know offer cheap deals on tooth implants, and nose jobs, bum lifts, the rest of it. But they have now realised vet fees in the UK are cripplingly high and are offering cut price animal treatments too. Now, Jason, can you take us through this? Surely the animals, just like the humans, would be being treated by someone who doesn't know their medical history. Um, it's it's cheaper, Susie. <laughs> 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 I mean, no, you I I've got I've got animals. I've got I've got a lovely dog which is outside my shed making lots of noise at the moment and digging up most of the garden oh. um, I've got a very kind of long-suffering cat which doesn't like a dog invading its space it, not at all I should yeah. think and, you know, I, I've been in a situation where you know a few years ago the cat got run over and we end up spending thousands of pounds putting it back together <laughs> and you know there's that that you can entirely understand you know but if you love your pet whether it's okay dog, cat, tortoise, goldfish, whatever you will, you know, people will spend an awful lot of money. But at the moment, vet bills are really expensive. 
<laughs> yeah, insanely high. My last dog had a developed a condition, an arthritic condition, which was sort of an inflammatory thing. It was going to just get him. So he had to, in order to get a proper diagnosis, he had to actually go to the Royal Veterinary College, the other side mm. of the five. And it was the only place that had the diagnostic skills to actually treat him so we can know what it was. Mm. Um, but I think a, a few days, uh, five days in there, was about five grand. I didn't have the money. Mm. Credit card was loaded. Just I was so desperate. He was about to die. And yeah. we didn't stay with him for a bit longer. But it's an awful lot of money. If you haven't got access to a quick credit card, you're stuffed. And it and it racks up really quickly because, you know, every single test they do seems to cost money. And then the medicines seem to cost money. And then one overnight stay is like, you know, that's like, you might as well go and stay in Maritz yourself for the same sort of price. Yeah. Uh, and Elizabeth says here, so pet owners can't afford to pay for vet bills, but they can afford to take them abroad to be treated. She's got a point. It's not easy to take your pet to Turkey, is it? Well, this is the thing. So it's substantially cheaper. We, I mean, we've got a um, um, in, in the paper, we've got, you know, the comparison of the cost of, of medical treatment for, for, for veterinary treatment for, for, mm -hmm. for pets in Turkey compared to the UK. And it's it's several thousand pounds cheaper across the board. Whether it's better for the pet to be flown out to Turkey um, and then be flown back. The, the, we, we, we quote in the article uh, um, people from the British Veterinary Service for the animal especially if they're ill to be you know sort of traveling um and it must be quite disorientating as well mustn't it um, you so, so. some animals would have to go in the hold of the aircraft and go through customs mm. and have jabs mm. and everything else others you're going to have to try and drive them there because they're too ill or you can't put a goldfish in the hold of yeah. plane ever um it's gonna it's really really hugely difficult and of course although the the humans are you know would be going perfectly healthy and maybe they just want a different mm. nose well in my case a haircut a different nose but the animals are by definition sick and traveling yeah. with them is going to be traumatic and they don't all like so, cars yeah i mean there's two aspects of this is one when it comes to the humans having cosmetic surgery um the, the, there's real problems with how uh, um, the kind of the efficacy of some of the places offering it, and and we you know we point out in the article I think in, you know since 2019 about 26 people have actually died mm. from overseas plastic cosmetic surgery, uh, which has gone wrong. So what's you know I don't I mean you know the the, the clinics we quote for the animals may be perfectly you know respectable. I, I'm I'm not doubting that at all, but I'm just saying that there's, there's that there is if it isn't a decent clinic what sort of address you have um but then the other aspect of this is which is what the the viewer just pointed out is why are vet bills so expensive in the uk mm. why are people being forced to travel abroad exactly it is obscene isn't it and there have been so there's been deaths linked to the turkey plastic surgery trade mm. as far as humans are concerned 25 brits have died since 2019 mm. it says in the mirror today papers have been full of horror stories as well about patients who've come back and had bad reactions to treatments mm. and their bums sort of blown up and stuff and they've either had go back repeatedly or they can't get it fixed they have to go to the nhs and the nhs says yeah. well we're not doing that because it's plastic surgery mate i'm not going to even knee your bum um would you do this for your pet, dear viewer? Is money tight? Perhaps you have older animals. Is this tempting in some way? Or is it something you would just find horrific and you would you would never even try to do? It doesn't make any sense that it, because of travelling with them. Um, there are some cheap prices here. So a diagnostic x-ray for a broken cat's paw, uh, surgery and aftercare, physio, medicine, a hotel for 10 days, airport transfers and a city tour thrown in. Why would you want that? Um, and a, a plus, a cut price nose job for you, all in for under 5K, would you believe? Um, now that does seem quite cheap. But I mean, you've got to have the convenience, I suppose, of um, a, a sick animal at the same time that you want your cut price nose job. Yeah. Um, and there are some issues, aren't there, in this country with independent vet practices being bought up by about six big conglomerates many of them owned by banks and so on, and or forced to deal with those conglomerates in return for the medicine or the diagnostic test. You know, they're the ones with the x-ray centre, that kind of thing. And that pushes prices up everywhere. Is there anything being done about this price fixing, Jason, that you mentioned that's, that's making it so expensive to own a pet? So the CMA, the Competitions and Market Authority, is looking into this at the moment. I, 
I mean, this is this is quite interesting because it's not just Vets where this has happened. Um, the other place they've moved into is 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 places like funeral parlors as well. So it, what you're getting is small independent firms uh, have been brought up primarily by private equity mm. on a huge scale. Um, and they they can kind of then use their their clout um, to one insist that only certain kind of you know medicines can be used in their clinics and their veterinary practices or their funeral parlors or whatever it is. I'm just saying this is how it works. This is how they mm. they, they make kind of a, the, the worst excesses of capitalism. Um, and um, and then they can also drive up prices because they've got monopolies. So if you've got just five firms, which is the situation at the moment, only a majority of, of, of a business, yeah, they, they basically set the rates. But what they've been quite sneaky about is they've kept a lot of the independent names. So people don't realise when they go to what they think is their local vet, it's actually owned by some, you know, Wall Street hedge fund. <laughs> yeah, it's astonishing. And like when my dog was ill, I took him to the, yeah. the vet's practice that my parents always took their dogs to, yeah. and I always took mine to. It was always independent. Yeah. And then I was quite surprised when I dug into how much these prices were starting to be. And also, yeah. the firm that owned that had been bought out by a, one of these big firms, and they also owned, get this, the crematoria. The pet crematorium. It's like, right, so you own the medicines, you own the extra yeah. machines, you own the vet, and you own the means of getting rid of yeah. the body. I don't like this. You just, you just, yeah. you've got me coming and going. And this is weird. This what happened to, we had a really good local vet. He's actually a neighbor of mine, he lives kind of 50 yards from where I'm speaking. Uh, and he was kind of like, you know, a small independent practice. And I'm a great thing about this vet was that, you know, he would kind of like use his discretion to treat mm. people who didn't have much money for for EBO reduced rate or for free, but that vet's now been taken over. He sold up, and all of that's gone. So that local community bit, that that kind of you know the the the, 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 the kind of somebody a vet seeing their job not just as kind of treating animals but being kind of part of a, a kind of you know a bit of society, and helping those who actually need a bit of help is gone, which I think is rather sad. But There's also this the fact now that um, there are far more treatments available for pets, uh, far more things that are needed perhaps to sort of get at a practice. So now I've found a, an independent practice, mm. but they still have to, for example, if you were going to have a certain kind of surgery, there's like a traveling surgeon that does the vet practices who will come in and do that. But, mm. you know, that all this stuff ends up being that eventually you do still have to deal with the big conglomerates because they control something. You can get like prescriptions online and stuff like that, but it's still, um, it's a bit cheaper, but it's still quite expensive. Wendy says they're cash strapped yet. They can afford to travel to Turkey too. She's spotted that. I suppose if you're, you're cash strapped, but you've got five grand in your pocket, you're not completely cash strapped, are you? You just don't want to spend the 10 grand for doing it here and not getting your nose job at the same time. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to take your, your animal to Turkey, you take your dog to Turkey or something. It's not like Katie Price hasn't been there before. Um, but what do you think, everybody? If you had a really sick animal, is this something that you do? Have you had a really sick animal and the family expense was just really crippling? What did you do when you got into that situation? It's quite difficult to know what to do because you're so emotionally invested in these animals. You'll you do anything when you get to that point, like you did with your cat when it was knocked over, Jason. If if you don't know the cat, you might say, well, look, it's been mangled by a car. Mm. It, might, it might be the time to say goodbye. But other times a vet will say now in ways perhaps they wouldn't have done a few years ago. They'll say, look, we can fix this. We can patch this up. We can do that. We can do the other. It's going to cost you X. And then mm. you have to say, okay, you know, no you know cat showed its gratitude, Susie. <laughs> Scratch your eyes out. It scratched my arm for pieces. I had to go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cats for you, Jason. Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to be mean. I know you love your pet. <laughs> but if you're going to save a pet, save the dog, mate. Yeah. If there's a choice, that's all. Uh, the, the dog is always going to be far more grateful. Um, so we've got, you know, there's pup care chips crematory all this kind of stuff there's this review being undertaken but you know the only way to fix this would be to either order those conglomerates to be broken up or perhaps set price caps and that's just never going to happen in a 
21st century capitalist society. So what might they suggest, do you think, with this review when it comes back? Oh, the, I've read some of these reviews in my life and I, and I want those years back. So the, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a long, very detailed report, which will uh, be impenetrable to read. And then at the end, it will go, we actually think the system's working quite well and we don't need to intervene. <laughs> yeah. oh, right. that's exactly what happened probably or they're kind of like the 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 the, the suggest the most kind of you know kind of limp kind of kind of suggestion to try and kind of introduce a little bit of kind of kind of equity into and into the quality into the market and it won't have any effect whatsoever they'd be very rarely into being the cma yeah no it was, <laughs> people often suggest an nhs for pets which i just think a lot of people are just not going to have anything to do with. But it's, if there was a like a, perhaps a nationwide government-backed mm. chain and you could pay for membership of it and therefore it did the occasional bit of free emergency care, mm. I can see that animal owners weren't quite mm. like really. But yeah. probably but the world is divided into those who, who, who like pets and those who don't, and you can just see the resentment it's going to cause. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We have heard from somebody now who has actually taken their pets to Turkey for some work. Uh, this is a picture of the animal. Uh, we <laughs> there we go. If you get the banner, you can see the joke. Um, rescue cat from Turkey. Look at those. For the benefits of those on the podcast, lovely white set of teeth. Looks like Rylan in a cat's face. Um, Marvellous. Thank you very much for that person. Um, now, we have managed to find some good news in the world for you that isn't about cats and their teeth. And here it is. <laughs> now, there's only one bit of news that's better than getting a hundred thousand pound, a hundred thousand percent return on your investment. And that's finding out that bookies had to cough up a six figure sum for a single figure bet. And that's what happened to one punter who landed £110,880 by betting just a one pound on jockey Frankie de Tori winning consecutive races in California over the weekend. Now he did it, and Labrooks coughed up, which I think is wonderful enough, but Labrooks think they were lucky too because de Tori rode an 11 out of 12 races and then he had to pay out for six, and it could have been a much, much bigger payout. Jason, is this proof that there is a one in a thousand chance gambling is good for you? While it's a dead sir, it's always it, going to be. A it, is, it is exactly what gambling should be. It should be a, a flutter for a bit of fun and then hitting the jackpot. Yeah, exactly. None of this how many times do you have to have a flutter? When you're kind of like gambling throughout football matches, it should be people going down the bookies, laying one pound bets and then coming back 108,000. Yeah, I hope you paid the tax in advance. Yeah, and um, top tip: bet on Frankie de Tory, even though he's now in America and from the UK. Yeah. yeah, it's always it's always I was good. To say, but, but the one the horse which didn't win, which would have made him the punter even richer, was the favourite as well. So there you go. Yeah, it doesn't always work out, but the bookies somehow or another always manage seem to win. At least they do pay some tax on it. Uh, Labricks, the group that own Labricks, Entain, paid half a billion pounds last year, their parent group, although they're also currently having to do a uh, criminal case avoiding deal with a tax man over some historic unpaid sums from one of his businesses. What a shame. They might have to pay out some more. What a pity. But it is nice to hear someone is. The bookies are quids in on this story because they've got a, got a good news story which encourages more people to gamble because they think they might win. So, you know. Why do you think pounds for all this publicity? Exactly. Perfect. This is where they put it out in a press release. We don't have the punter's name because Labrix yeah. doesn't know their name. Yeah. And then they go, look what's happened. Someone's won lots of money. Come and do it again. Go, go and have a go. Yeah. 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 Dad, but, you know, please, just because we give publicity to stuff, please don't go and, uh, you know, go to Turkey and get your cat's teeth done. That's probably not going to be beneficial. Gamble responsibly. Don't gamble. go to Turkey. <laughs> Yes, yeah, and if you're going to gamble, gamble, gamble yeah. on Frankie de Tory. And justice for minors. That's the free messages from this. <laughs> Those are the messages from today. Well, thank you, Jason, for taking <laughs> us through all that. Thank you for joining us on your day off. You can go and have the rest of the day to yourself, mate. I'm going to have to go and sort out a, a look of it, um, a hairdresser's appointment. And I will see you all again, I think, everyone, on Wednesday for another edition of the News Agenda, which will be the last one of the Easter holidays. Woo! And maybe we'll actually get some news by then. That would be handy, wouldn't it? But until then, everyone, uh, take care. Tatty bye. See you on the other side. Thanks,